Hi all. Uh, thank you, Dominic. Um, a small correction though, I'm still not a doctor. <laughs> I really wish that was true, but my vibe is in March. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> Um, yeah, so hi, um, I know you're all expecting Ash Montanaro, but he's uh, possibly having a baby at the moment, so that takes a bit of precedence, I think. Uh, but yeah, so instead I'll be presenting Facecraft today, um, and I'll be t telling you a little bit about our company. Um, is this okay? Can you hear me better? Yeah, okay, sorry. <laughs> okay, so yeah, I'll be telling you a little bit about our company and the type of work that we do, and then I'll tell you about my actual journey to getting there and how I came to be here not just by actually having a baby. Um, yes, so um, the company I work for, so it's Spacecraft. Uh, we are a, a quantum, quantum software startup. Uh, what we are interested in, to kind of reflect back on Martin's talk about hardware, so we're get, kind of entering the space of quantum hardware where we have these noisy intermediate scale devices uh, which is kind of marked by the Google Supremacy paper that I don't know if, if you have heard about. Uh, but the idea is that we're getting to this point where the quantum hardware can actually do something interesting. And our startup is interested in um, designing software and uh, new solutions and, and, and uh, communicating to uh, end users to kind of get the most out of this noisy small devices whether that's this year, the, the ones coming out next year, or in the, in the next few years, but that's kind of where we are focused. And the, the startup itself is based in two locations, we're in Bristol and in London, and the, uh, the base in Bristol is more focused on the software side of, of, of things, while the, the, the London team is working more on the physics side of things. Of so we, in, in the Bristol branch, we might look at how to actually code uh, new algorithms for those devices and so on, while in London uh, they might focus on more on the theory behind the solutions we're looking at, and the, phys the, phys the physics theory. Right, so this is the actual team that represents Facecraft, uh, that's, all, uh, that's all of us, that's both Bristol and London branch. What you can see here um, is actually a mix of PhD students, uh, graduates, as well as leading experts in the field. And also, we are not just a mix of kind of experiences. We're also a mix of um, mix of backgrounds from physics to mathematics, computer science, and I think to an extent uh, with quantum, it's increasingly common that someone has a background in more than one of those fields. So you'll have a mix of physics and computer science, or mathematics, which is obviously kind of essential, really. But yeah, so it's a mix of backgrounds and mix of experiences. Um. So our Bristol office is actually not this quite yet. <laughs> uh, we're currently located in a different startup space in uh, Berkeley Square, for those of you that know Bristol. Um, yeah, so, but we will be moving into QTech that again, Martin has mentioned earlier, and I think we'll probably hear more about QTech over the next couple of days, because it's a very important space. It's a, it's a space for quantum startups and quantum businesses to grow out of. And we're very excited to be moving in there and kind of be part of that quantum entrepreneurial spirit. So yeah, that will be happening soon. So if any of you see us in the job fair tomorrow and end up applying and joining us, you will probably be going to this office. So I, I told you a little bit about the company and the team and so on, um, but what, it is, what is it that we actually do? What, what, what does it mean to be trying to do software for the, these near-term devices? So, as, as an example of some research that we focused on recently, uh, I will tell you a bit about our Fermi Hubbard model and our research on it. So, this model is a, a fairly famous model in physics, um, very important for solid state physics, really. And the idea behind it is that you have uh, this kind of lattice here represented with these uh, green circles, where you have these uh, the sides of the lattice represented with the green circles. And those sides can be occupied by fermions. And fermions can have spins up and spin down. And the idea is those fermions, they can jump between the lattice sites, for example. So this is, this is something called a hopping interaction. And if you want to think about it in more of a mathematical representation, you have your Hamiltonian at the bottom. The part on the left represents this hopping interaction where the fermions are jumping from side to side. Similarly, you can have your fermions have spin up and spin down. And if, if you have a site with those spin up and spin down fermions, they can interact. And you can see that in the Hamiltonian in the, in the second part. 
So if you look at this equation at the bottom, it's, it looks fairly straightforward, it looks kind of symmetric and simple, and you might think, well, surely this doesn't do much, this doesn't model much, because the you know, world is more complex than that. But actually, this is the reason why this is such an important model, it's actually still very complex, it's really hard to solve, and it's actually, it, it represents a lot of important questions in material science. So it's important for things such as batteries, such as solar cells, uh, and, and superconductivity actually is, is a major, major, major focus for Fermi Hubbard, uh, people that research Fermi Hubbard model. Um, so it has many applications, um, and you know you might not use quite exactly this most basic Hamiltonian that I've just mentioned. You might want to add some more terms to it, but it's, it is the basic of all of this research, and the basis of the, all of this research. And we can see that actually classically, it is really hard to solve. Um, so not only do we not have like some kind of analytical closed form solution, we 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 do numerical. Um, Maybe even even numerical solutions can be quite hard, but yes. Yeah, so for for example, here we say that um, here we show that uh, I mentioned sorry that there's a, for a 22 site lattice, which isn't actually that big if you think about it. Um, you will need something of the order of um, seven terabytes of memory, 13 teraflops, and 512 nodes of a supercomputer. So if you imagine that's a lot of memory, a lot of time. The teraflops is, is the uh, kind of number of computations you need. And a lot of space as well, 512 nodes. And more than everything else, it's also a, a lot of power consumption. So if you try thinking about taking this further or a bigger, um, you, you're also incurring a large financial cost as well from just your power consumption from solving these kinds of models. So, this is exactly the type of type of thing that we usually think about quantum computers as being good at um, doing more doing computation faster in less space with smaller power con consumption and so on so can a quantum computer do this and that's exactly what we looked into and this is actually like a, a fairly um, it, it's it, it's a pretty developed field of research at the moment for these near-term devices uh, so we, we tried to solve the Fermi Hubbard model using something called variational quantum eigensolver. And the idea behind the variational quantum eigensolver it's a it's a quantum classical hybrid. So this is very common with most of these um, near-term devices. Instead of just using the quantum device to do all of your computation, you have some kind of interactions between uh, the classical part, which might be doing the optimization, which the classical computer might be quite good at, and the quantum computers are just not quite as good at yet, or not big, for, not big enough for. So the classical computer does the optimization, but the quantum computer actually does the Hamiltonian. And then you, you kind of feed that ham the, the results from the Hamiltonian into your optimizer and so on. So this is this hybrid approach. And that's, that's what we looked at, um, and we found that it's actually, uh, we found fa fairly positive results. Basically, we managed to optimize some of the algorithms that have already existed in the field and to um, apply them to Fermi Hubbard in a fairly efficient way so, so, so that we actually could carry out classical simulations of the quantum software. And we managed to do that up to 24, uh, sorry, the 12 uh, lattice sites. And so the idea being you're simulating your quantum chip and you're solving this um, uh, the Fermi Hubble uh, uh, model. And um, yeah, so to do that we had to run the numerical experiments in the cloud just due to um, ease of resources. Um, but yeah, so what we, what we found is that actually it's not just possible, it gives pretty decent results. Um, and just to kind of maybe point out one of those results, um, what you can see on here is the so this is one of the biggest ones, the big, biggest um, lattices that we ran. So it's 12 site lattices. Um, you can see three lines because a 12 site lattice can look in three different ways. You can have it uh, 12 sites in a line, or you can have two by six or a three by four kind of grid. So the one by 12 is the blue, the three by four is the green, and two by six is the red line. And what you're actually looking at on the left side is the infidelity of the solution. You want that to go to zero. So this is, if your solution 
is good compared to what you know to be the actual solution, the fidelity will be one, or kind of like 100%, you can think about that as, as that way. So the infidelity, the one minus fidelity should be zero for good solutions. And what you're looking at at the bottom axis is the unsets depth. So that's the depth of the circuit. You can think about that as the complexity of, of the physical complexity of the circuit, how many components you have that you need to run. And we can see that the lines are going down as we're going, um, as, as, as the uh, complexity of the circuit is increasing, the line is going down, and it's not just going down, it's going down exponentially, which means we're getting exponentially close to a good solution. No, not just a good solution, very good solution. So if you're looking at fidelities of about, uh, sorry, infidelities of about 10 to the minus two, that's, that's pretty decent. Um, yeah, so this is this is one of the results. If you're more interested in in, in our in our research, it's actually available on our archive. You can see the link down uh, at the bottom. Uh, sorry, the, the reference. Um, but yeah, so you can, you can or you can come chat to me about it or um, yeah, if you, yeah. Um, so yeah, so the last last part of my talk, I'll, I will just tell you a little bit about how um, how I ended end up at Facegraph, basically. So it's. A possible road to a career in quantum, um, or how I got to be here today. Uh, so I finished high school in Belgrade in Serbia. Um, after that, I went to California Institute of Technology, uh, thinking I'm going to get a bachelor's in physics. In the meantime, I changed my mind and decided to actually graduate in computer science. I still took a lot of physics classes, but I think um, the two are very linked, as I was mentioning before. And when it comes to quantum, they're even more, they're very intimate fields. I would say. Um, after that, I moved to Bristol, and I worked at a, a networking startup called Nodal as a software engineer for about a year, and then the engineering team got acquired by super, um, Cray Supercomputers, so I've got a thing for powerful computers, it would seem. <laughs> so I worked for uh, Cray Supercomputers for about a year as well, and I took some um, master's level classes in mathematics in the meantime, just because the call of academia was loud, I guess. <laughs> um, but yeah, and in the meantime, actually, the, the Center for Doctoral Training in Quantum Engineering, um, that again, I'm pretty certain you'll probably hear about over these couple of days as well, um, opened up. So I was part of the first cohort that um, came out of that, that center. And so I did my PhD uh, in, um, in, in boson distinguishability and entanglement. Um, so yeah, I've kind of jumped ships in, from bosons to fermions now, it would seem. <laughs> but yeah, still fun. Um, and then somewhere towards the end of that PhD, I decided there's a bonus level. <laughs> so I had this little spot over here called Vanya. Um, uh, and I, I went to maternity leave for um, about nine months with him, which was nice, nice uh, experience break away from quantum. And uh, then after that finished, I, I have joined Facecraft as the quantum software researcher, working on things like Fermi Hubbard model. Um, thank you for listening. I'm sorry it wasn't Ashley. <laughs> uh, but yeah, if you have any questions though, I, I am um, around and I will, I, I'm, able, I'm hopefully able to answer them. <laughs> Um, and we are hiring at the moment, and kind of at every stage, really. Uh, we're looking for uh, interns, we're looking for um, software research, quantum software researchers and quantum software engineers. Do come chat to me about what that actually means, if it just sounds intimidating. Um, and yeah, the deadline is very soon, but yeah, it will be at the job fair as well. So yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Sasha. Um, do we have any questions? We've got some time for some questions from the audience. Just have a come. So, um, Facecraft actually looks like it also could be like um, a traditional academic collaboration. What's the difference between that and the startup? Okay, that's a fair point. Uh, so we actually work quite closely with the hardware companies, which um, it, it can happen for some academic groups, but it's kind of much easier if you're a startup or a company that can have a certain type of special relations, I guess, with, with those companies. And um, also we're, because we're so focused on the industry, we are also have end users, for example, that we communicate to, which are also in industry. So it's a much more kind of um, on, on the, like every, all the communication tends to be on that level. Um, it is also 
much more practically geared. Um, so, for example, I come from a very kind of the theoretical physics background with my PhD, uh, where you know you have to get something to a hundred percent solution. Here, you might be looking at ninety percent because it's already good enough there. Uh, do you have any other questions from the audience? Okay, uh, um, What sort of clients does Facecraft work with? Um, I don't know how much of that I can answer. <laughs> but we do have, so you can think, like, so I was mentioning that we, um, we were working with framework habit model, which is kind of related to um, solid state stuff, stuff material science. So you can imagine that we might be communicating with material science type companies and then on the other side the uh, quantum hardware companies. I think some of our partners are, are familiar, which is we, we work with, we're working with Rigetti and with Google, for example, on the quantum hardware side. I'm not sure if it's known what our companies on the other side is, so I, I'm not going to comment if that's okay, sorry. But yeah, you can imagine. <laughs> yeah. uh, I think we have another question back real quick. <clears throat> this might be another question you can't answer. What programming languages and other technologies are you using in your development? Right, um, I think that's probably fine to answer, yeah. Um, so we, we use a mix, actually, um, because also the, the hardware companies that we work with use a mix, both on the quantum and kind of the classical side. So there's a, there's a few quant different quantum languages. Um, as I mentioned, there was, there's Google and Rigetti, they both have their own uh, language and compilers and so on. Um, so obviously we use theirs, and then on kind of like the, the usual classical languages that you would think of, we, we're using Python and we use um, C++ due to its efficiency, <laughs> uh, due to its speed, I guess. But efficiency would be wrong, I guess, to say, because Python would be faster to code in. Uh, but yeah, <laughs> anyways. Thank you for the talk. Uh, which my question is: Which cloud software did, did you use? Which cloud hardware did you use? Uh, yes, yeah, so we actually used Google Cloud um, again because they're our partner. It was uh, fairly easy to set up. Um, I think yeah. For now, we're also planning with sticking with that. Um, Quick question, where are you in the funding cycle in terms of seed funding, VC funding? Do you know? Ooh, I'm not the right person to ask that, sorry. Um, we did close a round, like I think we've already had one round, but I, I don't know past that. Um, I also know that I think there's some funding that we recently got uh, that hasn't been announced yet, but yeah. Great. Well, I think that's all the time we have for questions for Stasha. So if we can give another round of applause.